all the newest SIBO research findings for hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. There's been some really cool developments this past year, so don't go anywhere. We're going to cover all of them in this video. What's up and welcome to the video. I'm Dr. Daniel Ricciardi, gut health expert, licensed pharmacist, fitness enthusiast, creator of SIBO Shortcut, and the gut health supplement, Blow Blocker. Blow Blocker is a supplement for people with SIBO to help them with symptoms such as bloating, gas, and abdominal discomfort. More importantly, it's to help them repair their gut and keep SIBO at bay. People have been getting some really good results from this. Here's the latest customer testimony we just received. Her SIBO is gone. She has more energy. She feels like herself again. And as an added bonus, she's 20 pounds down. If you want to learn more, click the blow blocker link down in the description below. All right, let's get going with the video. In this video, Dr. Mark Pimentel, each year he does a webinar with Dr. Allison Seebecker and Siobhan Sarna to discuss his annual research findings. This video is going to summarize the eight findings that I found the most interesting and useful to you. And and stick around toward the end of the video because the last three findings are going to be some new treatments that could completely transform how we go about dealing with SIBO moving forward. As a quick disclaimer, the statements I'm going to make in this video have not been reviewed or approved by the panelists such as Dr. Allison Seebecker, Dr. Mark Pimentel, or Siobhan Sarna. These are just my own interpretations of the webinar after watching it. And if you want to check out this webinar, I linked it down in the description below. All right, the eight main findings from the webinar. Finding number one, this talked about how exactly rifaximin works and why it does not lead to bacterial resistance. Dr. Pimentel revealed that the way rifaximin works is that it enters the cells of the bacteria and it blocks the synthesis of plasmids. These plasmids are what creates resistance genes for the bacteria. So if the bacteria cannot make the plasmids, they can't create resistance for themselves. And as an added bonus, they found in the research that if you're using rifaximin with a different agent as well, because the bacteria can't use those plasmids, they also can't lead to resistance toward the other agent as well. For example, if you're using a different antibiotic with the rifaximin. Finding number two, breath test gases correlate with the number of bacteria and microbes microbes in the intestine. This means that when breath tests were conducted to see how much methane, hydrogen sulfide, or hydrogen showed up on that breath test, immediately after a jejunal aspirate was done, which means that they actually go into the physical small intestine and take the juice to analyze the number of microbes there. It's basically verifying if the breath test was accurate. And it showed that for methane and hydrogen sulfide in this past year, there is a direct correlation. It's very accurate where if the breath test gas shows up, it's higher. It means that those bacteria that cause cause that gas show up in the small intestine proportionally. For methane, the number one causative agent is Methanobrevibacter smithii, and then for hydrogen sulfide, it's actually Proteus mirabellus. And this breath testing for number of microbes was previously verified also for the hydrogen gas. If you want some more clarity on this, not just on breath testing, but also treatment protocols proven to work and how to heal your gut after treating SIBO, IMO, or intestinal sulfide overgrowth, check out my online program, SIBO Shortcut. All of this is included as well as individualized support in my private Facebook group, which is only available to members. There's a link to a free training down in the description below that explains the exact process I use from start to finish to help people deal with each different type of overgrowth. All right, on to finding number three. Finding number three was the ringing in the ears with neomycin. What is the deal with this? Because everywhere you look online, I feel like there's warnings or people that are apprehensive about using neomycin for this exact reason. According to Dr. Pimentel, he's only had one incidence ever that a patient had some sort of hearing issue when using an oral two-week course of neomycin. And this particular patient happened to have a cold when they were doing this. And after the cold went away, her hearing returned to normal. Neither he or Dr. Seebecker or myself have ever encountered a patient actually get ringing in their ears from using oral neomycin. According to Dr. Mark Pimentel, years ago, neomycin was often used for up to a year straight orally for, I forget the exact condition, but this was done and patients could develop ear ringing from this. In addition, intravenous neomycin also has shown to be able to cause cases of ears ringing. But for the purpose of treating SIBO, we're doing oral neomycin for two weeks. This does not seem to be an issue. Finding number four has to do with the elemental diet. Dr. Pimentel and his team found in the studies that they did this past year that days 10 to 14 seems to be a critical period of time for the elemental diet. In terms of the gas and breath test numbers, there may not be a great reduction from days 1 to 9, but that 10 to 14 zone seems to be, according to Dr. Pimentel, when the bacteria sort of give up and dramatic improvements can be noted in this last 4 to 5 days. So if you're doing elemental diet, he strongly recommends you do it full 14 days. Finding number five has to 
do with GLP-1 medications and SIBO. The GLP-1s are things such as Munjaro, Wagovi, and Ozempic. Two studies were done. They haven't been published yet, but it's pretty cut and dry. If you're using GLP-1 medications, this leads to more SIBO. And if you're trying to do a breath test, if you're on a GLP-1, it's probably going to say that you're negative for SIBO because lactulose, fructose, glucose, whatever you're using, probably not going to clear the stomach because your GI tract is essentially paralyzed and none of the sugars are even going to clear the stomach. So if you are on a GLP-1, he recommends getting off the GLP-1 for at least one week, preferably two weeks before you do your breath test. Okay, on to the cool part. Findings number six through eight now. These are the new potential treatment options for SIBO, IMO, and ISO. Finding number six, this is a new drug that is on the horizon. Right now, it is being called RNIB21. From my understanding of watching this webinar, it seems to be rifaximin combined with a special form of enteric coated sustain release and acetylcysteine, which is NAC. If you're not familiar with NAC, for the purpose of SIBO, it's used as a mucolytic, as a biofilm disruptor, because a lot of the hydrogen producing bacteria, such as E. coli and Klebsiella, they can hide in the mucus layer in the small intestine. And if you're just using rifaximin or just using antimicrobial herbs and nothing else, it's really hard for these agents to penetrate through that mucus and actually eliminate these microbes. So this is just entering clinical trials this month. You may be wondering, can you just use regular N-acetylcysteine? According to Dr. Pimentel, it seemed like the regular immediate release N-acetylcysteine may not make it all the way through the stomach because it may be breaking down the mucus in the stomach instead of making it all the way through to the small intestine. So it seems like this formulation may be better. And this medication is going to be indicated for patients with diarrhea typed irritable bowel syndrome. This is typically going to be the hydrogen dominant SIBO or the intestinal sulfide overgrowth. Finding number seven, this is another medication on the horizon. Right now, they're calling it CS06. This medication is for patients with methane-dominant symptoms and constipation. The study that he talked about in the video, this was done in rats. I know not humans like we want to hear, but it showed about a 60 to 70% drop in methane in the rats, and I believe this was all within the first 24 hours. So ideally, you would be getting good relief from symptoms sooner. It is important to note that this CS06, it seems like it does not actually kill the methane-producing archaea. Instead, it's probably going to leave the same amount of archaea in the intestine, but because it's working on an enzyme on those specific microbes, it just causes them to release less methane, therefore giving you less symptoms. So for me, with a methane overgrowth, would it be better if it actually eliminates these microbes? Probably because then you're kind of resolving the root cause a little more. This seems like it would be a maintenance medication that you would take long term. Nevertheless, it's a new mechanism of action, and I find it really intriguing in what it can do in the future. And it looks like there's going to be human studies on this within in the next 12 months. All right, lastly, finding number eight, this is the last agent I'm going to talk about. This is the one that I was the most excited about going through this webinar. Doesn't have a name yet. Looks like they're just calling it a novel biologic agent for SIBO. Doesn't really say more. If you're not familiar with biologic agents, a biologic agent, it's a type of medication made from living organisms or their products, such as proteins, cells, or DNA. Unlike regular drugs, biologics are made to target very specific parts of the immune system. And for the purposes of SIBO that's caused by food poisoning, which is the most common cause of SIBO. This novel biologic agent is actually going to be going in and targeting these anti-vinculin antibodies that develop in the blood of patients after they've been exposed to food poisoning. These anti-vinculin antibodies, we don't want them because they impair gut motility. So essentially by removing these anti-vinculin antibodies, for people that got their SIBO from food poisoning, this would in theory be addressing the ultimate root cause and permanently eliminating their SIBO. And according to Dr. Pimentel, it should be about eight to 12 months until this is available. Those are the eight key findings. I'm going to run through them really briefly right now. Number one, rifaximin does not seem to lead to resistance. Number two, breath testing gas correlates with the actual number of microbes in the intestine. Number three, elemental diet. Make sure you do the full 14 days. Number four, ringing in the ears from oral two weeks of neomycin does not seem to be a concern. Number five, GLP-1s lead to SIBO. Number six, RNI B21, new combo of rifaximin with sustained release and acetylcysteine for SIBO and ISO. Number seven, CSO6, new long-term agent to be used for patients with methanogen overgrowth to help with constipation and methane-dominant symptoms. And number eight, novel biologic agent to reduce antivinculin antibodies, potentially addressing the root cause of SIBO and ISO patients. If you want to check out any of these sections, once again, I'm going to link all the timestamps down in the description below so you can find them really easily. That is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, 
material or found it helpful, please like, subscribe, and hit that notification button so you see every time I post new content. Since you watched till the end, I think you're going to enjoy one of these two videos here next. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.